Thanks a lot, Alan. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining us for this webinar today and taking your time uh, to listen to us. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to uh, talk about who Tejas Networks is, uh, just in case some of you aren't familiar with us. Um, we're actually headquartered in Bangalore, India. And in fact, we're the biggest hardware uh, equipment provider in telecom uh, in India. Uh, and we also have a US headquarters in Dallas, uh, Texas. We're a leader in optical and data networking equipment, and we sell globally. In fact, uh, we have a presence in over 70 countries worldwide, and we have over 500,000 network elements already deployed. And in fact, more than 10,000 of those are deployed in North America. Many of you probably didn't know, but we actually have supplied North America primarily through partners in the past. Uh, under their brand. So you may have actually seen our equipment or seen it in bids or even deployed it at some point in time. Really quickly, we provide a broad range of services and technologies, but we specialize in ultra converge. And in fact, we really provide all of our capabilities through two product lines, one of which is the one I'm going to talk about today, which provides ultra converge broadband services. Uh, providing Ultra-converged platforms means that you're providing a lot of different service types across those platforms. So basically that means our manager has to be really sophisticated. We have a multi-layered management that uh, manages layer zero so through layer three today. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in the webinar. We have a technology we call software-defined hardware. Basically it's programmable hardware technology, FPGA technology that we utilize for a number of different things. Uh, number one, we utilize it to maybe converge functions into a single component that aren't sold as a single component today, so we can ultra converge things. Um, and number two, sometimes there are components that are excessively expensive or provide functions that we don't need, uh, so we can reduce the cost by providing our own uh, capabilities. Uh, and then because we have the programmability, it allows us to release new features and new capabilities pretty much ahead of the market. Um, all of our products are future ready. Uh, the product I'm going to talk to you to, about today has been used for many years. It was used, for instance, for 4G, and uh, now it is uh, 5G ready as well. Um, we have used the same uh, product for GPON, and now we're introducing XGSPON and NGPON2 on the same platform. And we've introduced multiple generations of switching fabrics for these platforms as well. Uh, to continue to scale with the requirements of the access networks. So before we talk about the product, I wanted to talk about why ultra converged. So where does your money go when you're buying stuff? What benefits does this bring you? So we'll talk about both capital and operational expenses. But let's, let's start with the capital things. So the obvious is, of course, the number of boxes. The more boxes you have, the more you're going to pay. And we'll get into why you're going to pay more uh, in a future slide. Uh, the number of interfaces required, in fact, that's kind of related to the topology of your network and the cost of your infrastructure as well. If you don't deploy an integrated uh, solution and you deploy multiple boxes, that will drive inefficiencies in the topology of your network, which we'll talk about a little later, which will introduce cost and cost you more for infrastructure, which is often more expensive than the product itself. And of course, then there are management systems and services. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, consolidating things under a single management uh, system makes things much easier. We'll talk about our management system a little bit uh, toward the end of the presentation. Operational expense. So what things cost me operationally? Well, the first thing, of course, is number of boxes. <laughs> so the more boxes you have to, to uh, deploy, the more difficult it is operationally. And in fact, even starting with uh, installation. Um, uh, if you have to install multiple boxes, not only do your operator says it requires more work, but it also requires more knowledge from your, uh, from your technicians as well. Um, so it, it costs you more uh, operationally in training those operators as well as paying them to do uh, the installations. A number of interfaces required, the same thing. The more, the more you have, the more uh, difficult it is to deploy. In fact, the more interfaces you have, uh, the more room there is for making mistakes. Things can be cabled incorrectly and We'll talk about how a disaggregated architecture or a non-converged architecture costs you in some interfaces and topology a little later. 
The amount of infrastructure, of course, uh, as I talked about on the capital drivers, but that also costs you operationally uh, because infra infrastructure not only means fiber plants and things like that, but it means uh, space and power, especially if you're using co-location and you're, you're paying for valuable space. Uh, and then there, of course, operationally are management tasks. If you're managing a bunch of different boxes uh, and you're provisioning different service across those boxes, it's often more complicated, requires more managers, uh, which uh, costs you on the capital side, but it costs you more operationally, having your operators learn the different managers and provision things independently. All right. So the good news was is that uh, you saw a lot of commonality between capital and operational expenses. So if we solve those issues, then we, uh, we solve a lot of capital and operational problems that you can run into. So what are some of the technologies that are enabling ultra-convergence? We've, we've talked about convergence forever, right? And we've talked about packet optical and things like that. You'll see from this pack platform, we are actually integrating other things beyond what traditional packet optical platforms talked about. So not only Ethernet and WM capability, but things like PON and circuit emulation services and those types of capabilities as well. And what's, that made, made, what's made that easier is basically consolidation of Ethernet uh, across all service types. So uh, even more recent services like uh, CIPRI or CPRI for wireless front hall now have moved to Ethernet more recently. So that evolution has been going on for a long time, but it's still actually going on. Uh, use of layer two and access and aggregation networks broadly makes it easier to converge all those applications that use layer two into a single box. And of course, along with that is standardization of MEF services, which made it easier to use ethernet. Uh, and then basically the East industry supports around Q&Q &Q and MPLSDP. So using the same protocols then makes it easier to use the same system with the same software, uh, the same mechanism for provisioning. And the other things that help you are advances in switch uh, chipsets. Of course, the cost of switching going down uh, helps tremendously. Um, just because now you can install a bigger fabric and uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so just because now you can install a bigger fabric and essentially accommodate more service types. Uh, advances in system on a chip technology, um, that helps you as well. So you can consolidate things into a smaller package than you could before. So things like pawn system on a chip technologies have become more sophisticated include more generations of PON, like GPON, SGS PON, et cetera. And then, of course, advances in FPGA uh, technology. Uh, the, the smaller FPGAs get, uh, the cheaper gates get, the better we can use those technologies to integrate more uh, capability. All right, so let's look at why more network elements cost you more. It seems, seems uh, easy uh, to, to figure that out, but and if you start to think about it in more detail, you can figure out what components of network elements really uh, introduce that. Uh, of course, there are things like fans, metal and backplane and redundant power supplies. And, and those do cost you more as you add more boxes because as you add more boxes or as you add more capability and more switching capacity, those things really don't scale and cost linearly. So you can generally power a single box with as much capability as multiple boxes for less cost. And the same goes for cooling, the same goes for metal, backplane. Uh, the exception with backplane is if with a bigger box you're trying to do more advanced things like more capacity per, uh, per, per um, slot, that could basically make the backplane more complex, which could introduce some cost, which will offset some of that cost. Now, in our particular case, that hasn't happened. So we basically provide more capacity and we uh, do it at a lower cost than it would be to provide multiple boxes to do that. Then there are other things like OEM cards, which you replicate across uh, multiple chassis, multiple redundant controllers, which you replicate across multiple chassis, and then redundant fabrics, of course. Um, and fabrics are one of the places where you can eat a lot of cost very quickly. And just like power and fans, that, uh, the cost of a fabric doesn't scale with the size of the fabric linearly. So basically, I could provide a fabric that's three times as big as another at probably 30, 40% less, at least from a pure cost standpoint. All right, so let's look at some of the, um, uh, some of the costs of infrastructure and, uh, and, and topology, network topology, when you deploy multiple boxes versus a single box. Of course, you know, different vendors have different levels of integration. So, 
The amount of this you run into will vary depending on what solutions you're looking at. Uh, in our case, we actually combine all of these capabilities. So uh, we uh, provide uh, legacy services uh, over circuit emulation. So TDM and PDH uh, interfaces, we provide wireless, cap uh, wireless backhaul capability, business services capability, and pawn capabilities, which all use carrier ethernet, both Q and Q and MPLSTP. Uh, you know, and some of these applications require a few more layer two features like wireless backhaul requires uh, timing and synchronization, which might require 1588 and Y1731. So in order to integrate all these capabilities, we have to add those additional features and make sure they're all included. But the good news is, is it really doesn't drive the cost of memory and controller uh, through the roof. So it, it actually doesn't add much uh, to the additional cost. Now, the other problem is, is if you use multiple boxes, you're basically, and you don't have a single switch fabric, you're going to have to uh, backhaul each of those boxes. So whether you're using uh, leased or, uh, or owned uh, fiber backhaul, or you're using gray or WM, it costs you something. So you may need a wavelength per box, or you may need an actual fiber per box if you're using uh, gray fiber which as you know, can get very expensive, especially if you're leasing it. So a lot of the big costs to you are actually in the infrastructure yourself. And as I mentioned earlier, that infrastructure could, um, could cost you more than the product itself over time. Now, your other option is, is you could add another box uh, next to those uh, uh, individual boxes and do aggregation locally and then uh, aggregate over the backhaul. So you don't have the inefficiencies of the backhaul. But if you do that, then basically you're adding uh, interfaces, you're adding optics, and you're adding yet another box in the access network. You're complicating management and you're increasing costs. So it's much more expensive uh, proposition, one way or the other. So why, why pawn uh, in the same, same device? Um, so typically if you're, you're delivering services with a carrier ethernet switch, wireless backhaul or business ethernet services, you're generally doing a home run from the switch out to the uh, end sites. Um, now you may have a ring to do that, so the fiber infrastructure is actually uh, a little more efficient than what I show here, but you're still, even if you have a ring, uh, if it's gray optics, you're still using a fiber per, or a fiber pair um, per, uh, per uh, end client, and you're also eating an interface per end client as well. And those interfaces cost you money, that fiber costs you money, those wavelengths cost you money. You can deliver, if you're doing, especially if you're doing lower rate uh, uh, services, like maybe 10 and 100 services, you can use pawn technologies to deliver those. Even I've even seen carriers that uh, use pawn technologies to deliver gig services because the end customers can be highly oversubscribed just because they're not heavy users or maybe it's partially residential, partially business, and one turns down when the other turns up. So there are a lot of advantages and it eliminates fiber infrastructure, uh, because you can run out to some common point and then put a very inexpensive passive splitter, which doesn't have ongoing electrical requirements, and then run fiber from there. Or you can even put the splitter in one of the end destinations and not have to worry about uh, eating the electricity in that particular uh, destination. Uh, for instance, if one of them might be colo, for instance, you that uh, could get to be expensive. So, so PON can save you. PON is often used for the same things that you would just use a regular carrier Ethernet switch for, and it can also save you money in both infrastructure uh, and deployment costs. So one more thing on network architecture, uh, even if you're in a metro, metropolitan network in an urban or suburban environment where you have a single CO that's serving a bunch of uh, uh, suburban uh, housing areas and business developments and things like that, even in that case, all these savings are applicable to you, right? Because you still will end up uh, replicating the uh, boxes in that single uh, CO or hut or wherever you're deploying it. Uh, and you still will have to backhaul all those boxes as well. But the benefit becomes even better if you're a, an, or a, rural, a, a rural provider, because basically you have a lot more locations to provide, right? Now you have fewer subscribers, but the boxes only get so small. So there's a certain size box you're gonna end up having to buy. And by the way, having a single uh, infrastructure with a centralized fabric solves that because you can scale it uh, more incrementally, uh, just with uh, line cards and things like that. But, but the key is you basically have more places to deploy. Likely in a lot of those places, you'll have multiple service types and the need for these technologies and you'll run into the cost that I talked about before 
uh, and more so than if you are an urban or suburban uh, provider. All right, and finally, the operational implications. I talked about management systems and things like that, the cost going on. So there are other operational considerations that you have when you have more than one box, <laughs> right? So uh, for instance, if you do what I said on uh, one of the previous slides and you try to aggregate between them and maybe build interfaces between them or add another box to do local aggregation to make the grooming more efficient over your uh, backhaul, then basically you're introducing more connections. And the more connections you introduce, the more chance is somebody's gonna make a mistake. Somebody's gonna make a mistake and sometimes those cost you a lot of money trying to troubleshoot and, and undo them or cost you in turn up time, which ultimately costs you business. On space, if you're consolidating into single device, likely it'll be smaller and utilize less power. So uh, especially if you're in a co-location or something like that, uh, where power and space comes at a cost, then, uh, then basically uh, you can save a lot of money. Uh, management <coughs> directly. So if you're managing everything out of a single box, number one, it usually requires fewer management systems, uh, especially if you're not buying that, uh, especially if you would have otherwise bought those boxes from multiple different vendors who all have their own management systems and all had different ways of doing things. So it's, it's not only the cost of using the individual management systems and maybe provisioning differently, but it's also the cost of learning all of those management systems. So in our case, because we ultra converge all these services, they're all rolled up under a single management system from layer zero all the way up to layer three. And things like alarming become cleaner because we can do uh, correlation and things like that that multiple managers maybe don't do. Provisioning is less complex because it's the same for every type of service. It doesn't vary for your pawn service and for your carrier ethernet. Troubleshooting is much easier if you're troubleshooting within an, uh, a single box. And then finally, integration into third-party managers is simpler as well uh, because you only have one thing to uh, integrate with, our management system. Or of course, you've got one box to integrate with if you want to go uh, to the box. All right, so what does Tages have to offer uh, to help uh, fix this problem? Uh, as I've already uh, indicated, we have our 1400 Ultra Converge family of products. Um, now, the Ultra Converge does have uh, chassis-based systems as well as pizza box systems. And there's a reason we do that. That's because, especially if you're a rural vendor, there might be locations where you don't need uh, multiple different application types. You don't need PON and carrier ethernet, uh, for instance, or you don't need emulation. Uh, and so you want a specialized box. And we do offer those as well. Uh, but the beauty is that they are operated the same way our chassis-based uh, systems managed from the same manager, systems are provisioned in the same way. Uh, so if you're using the, our uh, converged boxes in some locations and then our not so converged other locations, uh, you still benefit from all the operational savings, all right? And uh, the big boxes you can see, we provide multiple different sizes so you can cost optimize around the amount of fabric uh, that you want and the size of the box and the type of interfaces. Uh, we offer from one gig all the way up to 100 gig today off of these interfaces. And all of these boxes will let you put WM optics in any, any port because everything is pluggable that has a form factor that uh, supports a pluggable optic like an SFP plus or CFP2 and those types of things. We don't have the limitations that a lot of carrier ethernet boxes have where they can only have uh, so many colored optics across the box for thermal reasons and things like that. We've made sure we solve that issue. Um, and now you'll notice there are different fabric sizes as well. Um, but what I do wanna mention is that even each of the chassis sizes has different fabric sizes. So for instance, the seven slot, you can do, if you only need 64 gigs worth, you can do 64 gig fabric, uh, or you can do a 200 gig fabric. And we actually have a 300 gig, or 100 gig fabric for that one as well. Um, our 13 slots, uh, which is actually being introduced in the fall, we have a 200 gig fabric and a 360 gig fabric. Um, and then, of course, the large one uses a, a terabit fabric. So not only can you pick and match, uh, match your um, uh, switching requirements and uh, box size uh, to your applications, but you can also uh, uh, be selective within a box as well. And the pizza boxes that we provide have a mix and mash of uh, applications. So for instance, uh, the one pizza box that you're looking at at the top provides 64 gig worth of switching, carrier ethernet uh, services, as well as uh, circuit emulation. 
And the box that you see at the bottom is uh, a pawn. So if you have it, uh, places where you're just doing a wireless backhaul and business ethernet search, so you're combining the applications, uh, but you're using pawn to deliver all of that, then we've got a box that cost optimizes is around just pawn. All right, so robust software set, which we have to have to support all of these capabilities within these boxes. Uh, easy to use graphical craft. So our craft on the box is graphical and of course in the manager. Single manager for consistency. So uh, as I mentioned before, we manage everything from layer zero to layer three and doing everything across the layers is as like as it can possibly be. So the point and click provisioning and across each of the layers you have uh, the choice of either manually provisioning or auto provisioning. And so everything's consistent. So it makes it much easier for your operators. To uh, we have support for Q&Q &Q and MPLSTP. Um, and this box is not a new box. It's field proven. There are tens of thousands of these boxes scattered throughout the world. So it's already out there and people are using them. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, WM optics everywhere. So what does that mean for your applications? So we have as I mentioned before, a lot of these applications, wireless backhaul, business services, triple play, legacy migration, they're all provided via ethernet, but you have to have different capabilities in order to support them all. So for instance, in, uh, for, uh, for legacy migration and supporting that uh, PDH, you have to have timing, right? So we support bits, clocks, and we have uh, local timing connections, or uh, we support 1588 and Synkey, 1588 slash all, but we support Synkey today as well. Um, and you also need things like Y1731 and maybe 1588 as well for wireless backhaul. So we add all those additional features and make sure uh, that they're provided so you can provide any type of service out of it. All right. And of course, as I mentioned before, having a single box gives you simplified operation, more efficient use of fiber, uh, and of course, cop cost optimizes for your particular application. Some other interesting applications that we see with this particular box is, um, uh, is uh, Alienware. So Alienware, as I mentioned, we use colored optics uh, in all the ports you can. You can put color um, and so say, for instance, you have a site that has WM today, or maybe even has carrier ethernet today with WM, uh, and you wanna add pawn to it, or you wanna add circuit emulation, or something that that box doesn't already have. Instead of having to buy our WM as well, you can basically buy our box, host the optics directly on our box and run it over that third party system. So, um, if, and we've done this many, many times in the field. We've run over many different vendor systems. And if you become interested, we can certainly provide uh, lists of those deployments uh, for that as well. Fiber relief and router bypass. So say you have multiple routers that have 10 gig interfaces between them. Uh, and maybe they're gray optics today. And so you're eating lots of 10 gig interfaces uh, uh, between those routers, which may be in different uh, data centers, for instance. So the advantage that we can have here is you can put our box in, we can aggregate all those 10 gigs maybe into 100 gig, then we can carry those over WDM and only use one of those fibers instead of all those 10 gig fibers and free up the other stuff for other things. We can also do single fiber, so we don't even have to use a fiber pair, which you were using for each of the 10 gigs. We could do a single fiber uh, implementation. And then also we can, uh, uh, we can do router bypass as well. Um, so uh, when you were interconnecting those routers directly, you probably, even if you had to go from router one to router four, you were probably connecting to router two. <laughs> and so basically you were eating up ports there. When you put in uh, this bypass, basically we can carry the uh, optics directly or the 10 gig directly from uh, router one directly to router four instead of uh, stopping at router two as well. And then of course, aggregation, uh, all of the applications that I talked about before will require aggregation, but there are cases where you may wanna put it in just to aggregate where you haven't been aggregating before. So say for instance, you have applications that have remote routers uh, and then you have a uh, local router. Um, and, uh, and, and you're running 10 gig interfaces uh, directly from the remote routers to the uh, uh, local router, uh, then you can put in our box just like you did in the previous example, uh, do aggregation maybe into 100 gig, run it across a ring as WM or over a gray connection, um, and then hand off a single 100 gig uh, to that uh, core router. So you save fiber and you uh, essentially don't have to um, aggregate. All right. Uh, you don't have to add expensive 100 gig interfaces to all of those routers. 
All right, and so finally, there's our management system. Um, as I mentioned, we have a single management system, manages layer zero, so layer three, all the uh, uh, carrier class functions you expect. It's a, it's a um, redundant manager. It does both manual uh, provisioning and auto provisioning. And with auto provisioning, you can do things like exclude, have it exclude nodes and routes and even specific switches. Uh, full graphical user interface, of course, it's full F caps. And of course, it does things like remote software download, quality of service, SLA reporting, um, auto discovery. We use LLDP on all our network elements and configuration management. And, you, and because we're running multiple layers, you can even do things like click on a link and see what layer two services are running over that, see how utilized that link is, how much space is reserved for each of the services that runs across it. So lots of nice features come from integrating all those functions into a single uh, network manager. So finally, in summary, the technology exists today to build highly integrated equipment uh, that we've been talking about for decades. So now we are, we are getting even better at it. As you can see, we've integrated a lot of things that aren't typically integrated into a single network. Integrating network functions that have common requirements results in significant CapEx and OpEx savings. Uh, and then finally, we'd love to talk to you about the TJ1400 uh, if you're interested. And if you need to contact us, you can contact me directly and I'll put you in touch with the right people. So with that, I'll hand it back to Alan for Q&A.